Okay. Let's get started. So, first of all, I think uh, I'm going to extend the deadline until evening today. So, if you are not, please submit your assignments as a single PDF document, either online or you print it out and submit it in class. So, you can't have like half the assignment on Carmen, half the assignment here. MATLAB codes, yes, they have to be submitted on Carmen because I don't want you to print out MATLAB codes here. And of course, we want to be able to run the MATLAB code. If we see that your solution is wrong, we could at least go back to your MATLAB code and tell you exactly where you went wrong. Yes? So, do you want us to, I mean a single PDF, do you want us to put the MATLAB code on the end or do you want to have it separate? Like no, MATLAB code has to be separate okay. because we can download the M file and we can run it our, at our own computer if something goes wrong in your answers, right? We should be able to do that um, so that we can figure out where exactly you went wrong. Yes? It has to be, well, you know, like assignment one problem 2b dot m, assignment one problem 5b dot m, right? So that's how I've instructed, right, on the instructions, right? Um, but don't, uh, so for instance, for 2b, you may have written like 5m files, just convert them into 1m file and submit it as a single m file, not as like five separate m files. It's just easier to grade uh, once you are, uh, if you're looking at the code, everything is at one place. But uh, for future assignments as well, either you print out the plots and submit it with your assignment, or you submit everything electronically on, like handwrite your solution, attach the plots as PDF, and then submit a single PDF document online on Carmen. Uh, it's very difficult to, to have uh, grading done on paper as well as on Carmen, it's, it's, it's difficult for the grader and I know some of you are graders, so you, <laughs> you want your life to be simple, not more complicated. Uh, all right, uh, let's uh, continue our discussion on manifold suboptimization method. Uh, the previous lecture we had discussed uh, why a convex set uh, sorry, a concave function, if you want to minimize a concave function over a convex set, you will have the solution at, the, at one of the extreme points. I, I didn't really want it to cover the proof because it was pretty complicated, but I hope uh, now that I've covered it, I hope some of you are convinced about the proof and some of you are still trying to digest that proof. Uh, I'll give you enough time to digest it. Uh, but that leads us to the following Problem, I want to minimize a function fx such that ax is less than or equal to b. Um, of course, if the function f is concave, you know that the solution will be one of the vertex of this polytope. But this is true for, in gen I mean, we are trying to come up with an op optimization algorithm in general for any nonlinear function fx. So <clears throat> before we start the discussion, about this specific algorithm, let's try and understand what the motivation of studying an algorithm which, oh, let me rem remind you what the algorithm looked like. So you have this polytopic constraint, something like this. And the idea in this algorithm is to be on the surface and take steps along the surface and edges uh, at every point of time so that you are in the descent direction and then converse to x star uh, eventually. So at every point of time you are restricting yourself to be on one of the surfaces or one of the edges of this polytope and you go inside the set only when it is absolutely required for you to go inside the set. Otherwise you try to stick yourself to the surface of uh, this polytope. Okay? So ax less than equal to b constraint implies that your con convex set looks something like this, okay? It's a polytope in n dimension space. X is in Rn. Of course, I'm going to draw all the figures in three dimensions. Well, on a two dimensional plane, I'm going to draw three dimensional figures. Uh, but all the concepts can be, uh, are true even for n-dimensional spaces, and so if you have better imagination than me, you can imagine 
how this algorithm will work in n-dimensional space. Okay. <clears throat> so let's try and uh, go over the motivation for doing something like this. So remember in the gradient projection method, the idea was that I will pick x bar k equals to x k minus s k gradient of f x k plus. Okay, so I'm going to project the project. Uh, this particular point back onto the convex set. Okay, that was the idea in gradient projection method. And remember, we had done projection for three specific sets, box constraint, spherical constraint, and for subspace, AX equal to zero constraint. Right, and for all those three cases, we had a closed form expression for the projection, and it was, very, it was a very simple operation to do. Projection was a simple operation. And I'd mentioned at that point of time that projecting onto a set of this type is extremely difficult, right? Do you remember that conversation we had? So projecting onto a polytope is very difficult, but projecting onto subspace AX equal to zero is easy. Box A less than equal to X less than equal to B is easy. And then sphere norm of x square less than or equal to r is also easy. Okay, uh, this is the two norm. Okay, and a x less than or equal to b hard. Okay, the projection on this set, but this particular set is hard. Okay, all of you agree with this? Okay, this is just a recap of what we have done. So the idea in uh, uh, manifold suboptimization method is The idea in manifold suboptimization method is that instead of trying to project a vector onto this polytope, I am going to project the vector onto this surface, okay, or onto this particular line. And as we will soon see, that amounts to uh, doing the projection onto a subspace of this type. Okay, let me repeat that again. Projecting onto this polytope is extremely difficult. So instead of trying to projecting, instead of trying to project the vector onto this polytope, I'm going to project the vector only on the subspace at which the current xk sits. So if this is your xk, you are going to project it on this subspace you're going to find a feasible direction in this subspace. If your xk was here, you are going to find a feasible direction in this particular subspace. Okay, not, not in a three-dimensional plane, but in a two-dimensional or one-dimensional plane. So that was, that's the idea of manifold suboptimization method. And if you do that, you're essentially trying to solve an optimization problem with this constraint, which is much, much easier to solve, okay? So in order to introduce the algorithm, I have to introduce some notation and uh, talk a little bit about the consequences uh, of uh, trying to find a feasible direction onto uh, these planes or edges. So first of all, let's assume that if there are any redundant constraints, you have removed those constraints from, the, uh, from this particular problem, okay? So no, no redundant 
redundant constraints. Uh, that's my assumption. So what do I mean by redundant constraint? So let's look at an example of a redundant constraint. I want my x1 to be less than or equal to 5. I want my x2 to be less than or equal to 6. And I want my x1 plus x2 to be less than or equal to 13. OK. Which of the constraint is redundant? x1 plus x2 less than or equal to 13. OK. So all of you would agree that this constraint is redundant because we are already constraining x1 to be less than or equal to 5, x2 to be less than or equal to 6. So x1 plus x2 will definitely be less than or equal to 11. So adding a constraint which says x1 plus x2 has to be less than or equal to 13 or for instance 12 or for instance 11 is actually a redundant constraint. We need to remove such constraints from this set of constraints that I've written. OK, is that clear? So you write the optimization problem, and you, you have to identify that there are no redundant constraints in your optimization problem. So that's number one step. And we are not going to talk about how to remove redundant constraints, but is wanted any to. Is there computational method to uh, remove redundant constraints or to identify them? I'm sure there would be some which MATLAB has implemented, but I don't know of any. Like the book hasn't talked, us, uh, talked to us about how to remove redundant constraints. but. Uh, Yeah, but, but, but I think uh, based on the problem, so you know, in physical problems, you kind of know what the redundant constraints are, right? So if you're solving a real world problem, you would know it. For an abstract problem of this type, uh, I, I don't know what would be an efficient way of figuring out redundant constraints. But I'm sure there are some, because MATLAB has implemented it internally. All right. so. I am given a problem in which I have removed all the redundant constraints, or there are no redundant constraints. Now for every x, I am going to define s of xk as, for every xk, I am going to define s of xk as OK. I, I need to introduce some more notation. So I'm going to do that. So AX less than or equal to B is same as AJ transpose X less than or equal to BJ, J equals to 1 to R. And the matrix A is A1 transpose, AR transpose, and B is B1 to BR. So this is a matrix in R, R cross N. And this is a matrix B in R, R. OK. So I've written A in a specific form. So what is my set of active constraints? So J such that AJ transpose XK is equal to BJ. OK, and I'm going to define AK as a, as a matrix of AJ transpose, where J is an S XK and BK to be BJ, J is an 
S X K. This is called set of active constraints. And uh, I'll go back to this figure, and I'm going to name the surfaces. So this is my A1 transpose x equals to B, B1, A2 transpose x equals to B2, A3 transpose x equals to B3, and the face on the opposite side would be A4 transpose x equal to B4. And let me label some points. So this is my x0. This is my x3. 4, 5, 6, 7. This is my x7. This is my x6. OK. So I need your attention now. All right, so at x0, which constraint is active? Constraint 1 is active. What about constraint 4, 2, and 3? Not active, OK? So since x0 is on this particular surface, only this constraint is active, and the other constraints are not active. So my a0 is equal to a1 transpose, transpose OK? Now I come to x3, point x3, which constraints are active at x3? Two constraints. Which ones? A1, uh, transpose x equal to b1, and a4, transpose x equal to b4. OK, so how many of you agree with him? Only a few people agree with you. <laughs> All right, so everyone understands that at this point, only one constraint is active, whereas the other constraints are not active because the point lies only on this surface, and it doesn't lie on any of the other surfaces. Now, when you reach this particular edge, so a point x3 is on that, that edge, and that edge is formed by joining. It's the intersection of this plane and that plane, the plane a4x equals to b4, that hyperplane. Therefore, at x3, there are two constraints that are active. One is the constraint on this side, and the other one is the constraint on that side. So my A3, what is my A3 going to be? A1 transpose and A4 transpose. OK. Now I reach X4. What constraints are active at X4? So X4 is this point this vertex. I want to write A4. Someone who hasn't spoken until now, who wants to attempt this problem. So what constraints are active at point X4? No, you've already spoken in the class before, so you're forbidden for speaking in the rest of the class. <laughs> yes? 1, 3, and 4. Yeah, that's right. So A1 transpose, A3 transpose, and A4 transpose. OK. So in a three-dimensional space, this is a rank 3 matrix. OK. So we'll get back to it in a bit. Uh, the fact that at x4, three constraints are active in a three-dimensional space. Uh, what about x6? Which constraints are active at point x6? So I have a1 transpose x and a3 transpose x. So these two constraints are active. 
So my A6 is going to be A1 transpose and A3 transpose, and so on, right? So at X7, only A3 transpose X is active. At X star, only A3 transpose X is active, okay? All other constraints are not active. All right, any questions so far on the set of active constraints? Okay, so all of us understand that every point, what are the set of active constraints? Now, let's say uh, AK is the set of, act so I'm sitting at XK, and AK is the set of active constraints. What are my feasible directions D, such that XK plus D still lie, so the S of XK plus alpha DK, so I want to find the set of feasible directions DK such that XK plus alpha DK is the same as S of XK for small alpha. So my question is, what are the set of such DKs? Yes. Okay, so yeah, that's right. Okay, so the idea is that if we want this condition to hold, so remember, A of XK, AK of XK is equal to BK, I want AK XK plus alpha DK to be equal to BK, which is to be equal to AK XK, which implies that AK DK has to be equal to zero. Right? So the, my set of feasible directions are the ones where AK multiplied by DK has to be equal to zero. All right. Okay. So what does that imply in this figure? If I'm sitting at X naught and I'm, I want to move in some direction and I'm restricted to move only along this plane, okay? I'm not allowed to move, go outside this plane until I hit one of these edges. So I, I'm only allowed to move along this plane, which means that the set of active constraints must not change for small step sizes which means that the direction has to be such that AK multiplied by DK has to be equal to zero. Okay. Now, here is the idea. I start at X naught and I realize that, okay, this is a possible descent direction. Once I reach the edge, then I only have two directions. I can either go this way or I can go that way. And so I have to fi figure out which one is a descent direction. So I'm going to figure out, let's say this is my descent direction. So I'm going to go for a little bit, figure out the descent direction again, then come to x3, figure out the descent direction again, come to x4. Once I reach x4, all three, there are three constraints that are active in a three-dimensional space. So now I need to relax one of the constraints in order to get to the next descent direction. Okay? So let's say I decided to relax this constraint. So I relax the A4 transpose X equal to zero constraint, and then my descent direction would be this constraint, the, I mean this direction, where only A1 and A3 are active. And then again, I'm going to keep descending along different directions until I reach a point where I have to break away from this direction and move in a descent direction. Uh, because I'm not able to figure out a descent direction either going this way or going that way. So then I have to break away from this edge, I have to move on to this plane, and then I have to keep moving along the plane until I reach the point X star. At some point of time, I have to realize, I mean, if the X star is going to be in the interior, then I'll have to break away from even this constraint and then just do the usual gradient descent um, and move inside the particular set. So that's the, that's how this algorithm works. So at every point of time, you restrict yourself to be on a plane or an edge 
as long as you can find a descent direction. If you cannot find a descent direction, then you have to relax one of the constraints and then look, look for a descent direction until you reach the point x star, which is a local minimum for that particular problem. Not a local minimum, a stationary point for that particular problem. Yes. So when you go from x6 to x7, that is not satisfied, right? So you have to relax one of the constraints. So AKDK now is not zero. Uh, yes, because it will, well, we'll get to the thing, but yeah, AKDK will not be equal to zero. Uh, that's because at x6, both the directions are not a descent direction. Your function value increases. So you have to relax one of the constraint and then move on to some other direction. Yes? So like if we're at x4 there, how do we know which one to relax? We'll get to it in a bit, OK? But even, I mean, but that question is valid even at x6. How do you know which one to relax? You might go back onto a1, or you could go into a3, surface 3. So there is a reasoning with which you figure out which one to relax, which constraint to relax. OK? All right. So let's look at the algorithm. Uh, which part should I erase? So I'm going to erase this board, OK? OK. My dk star is going to be argmin of So HK is a positive definite matrix, um, which you can, you're free to choose whatever HK you like, as long as it is positive definite. Okay? So at every point, XK, I'm going to solve, I'm going to figure out what my matrix AK look like, what are the set of active constraints form the matrix AK, and pick an appropriate value of HK. So it could be second derivative of the function, or it could be an identity matrix. And then you have to figure out what the gradient of the function F is uh, at particular point XK. Now this problem is something that I can solve by hand. So let me write what the solution is. So I'm going to define mu as minus AK HK AK transpose inverse AK HK inverse gradient of the function FXK and then my D star, let me call it mu K, DK, well, how should I index it? OK, let me index it by k. That's fine. And dk star is going to be minus hk inverse gradient of f at xk plus ak transpose mu k. And let me make sure all the signs are correct.
oh, there has to be an inverse here. So AK HK inverse, AK transpose. Okay, everything is correct now. Okay. <coughs> All right. So at every point of time, I need to solve this problem in order to find DK star. Now again, let's go back to this uh, figure. At X naught, my feasible directions are all these directions. When I reach x1, I only have two directions to go in, okay, and I need to minimize this problem over only one of those two directions, d. Uh, at x4, remember that ak was rank 3, right? So a4 was, at x4, a4 is rank 3 because a4 is given by a1 transpose, A4 transpose, and A3 transpose. So what are the set of feasible directions? So what are the set of D such that A4 multiplied by D is equal to zero, given that A4 is a rank three matrix? Any thoughts? So this A4 is a rank three matrix, okay? This is my point x4. So if I have a4 d equals to zero, and a4 is a full rank matrix, what does it mean about my feasible directions d? There are no directions, right? Zero is the only feasible point. So which means I need to relax one of the constraints. So when ak is full rank, you, could, you will have dk star is equal to zero. So these terms will cancel out, and so your dk star will be equal to zero. So here is the idea, if dk star is not equal to zero, then it is, so let me write as claims, so this is number one. If dk star is not equal to zero, then it is a descent direction. What do I mean by a descent direction? gradient of fxk transpose dk star is strictly less than zero. Okay, that's the meaning of what, that's the meaning of descent direction. Okay. Why should this be true? If I want to prove that this inner product is strictly negative, how will I go about proving it? So here is one line of thought. D equals to zero always satisfies this expression, right? Which means that D equals to zero satisfies AKD equals to zero, which means gradient of FXK transpose DK star plus half DK star HK DK star is going to be less than equal to gradient fxk transpose 0 plus half 0 transpose hk 0. Okay? Why is this true? Because d equals to 0 satisfies the constraint and it is not an optimal solution 
to this optimization problem. So therefore, the function value at the optimal solution dk star must be less than or equal to the function value at 0. Okay. This implies that gradient of f transpose dk star is less than or equal to minus half dk star transpose hk dk star, which is strictly negative. Yes? Uh, how did that uh, argument, uh, that function came? This function? Yeah. So I want to find a descent direction which means that I want the inner product to be as small as possible. This has been our uh, modus operandi throughout this course, right? So we want the inner product with respect to the derivative as small as possible. And this quadratic term is only to make sure that D doesn't blow up. Otherwise you will have, if, if I didn't have this quadratic term, the solution to this will be minus gradient fxk multiplied by infinity or some such infinite number. So we want to make sure that it's not infinity. And so we put the second order term there. Can you explain this inequality? Again? This inequality? Yeah. yeah. So uh, going back to this minimization problem, this is my objective function. This is the constraint. D equal to 0 satisfies the constraint. So it's a feasible point in the set. So the function value, the objective function value at dk star because it's an optimal solution, must be less than or equal to the function value at 0. Right? Now this transpose is 0, this is 0. And I'm just taking this on this side, so I have a negative sign here. And hk is positive definite, dk star by assumption is non-zero. So this must be a negative number, and therefore this is a feasible descent direction. Okay. Okay, now there are two points at which dk star is equal to zero. One such point is x4 because the set of active constraints is full rank. The other point is x6 because if I try to solve this problem in one of these two directions, then it turns out that the optimal solution is x6 itself, okay? so. If you go in this direction or if you go in that direction, your function value increases. So dk star would turn out to be 0. So in both these cases, in the case of x4 and x6, I need to relax one of the constraints in order to figure out a descent direction. So once I relax the constraint, I increase the number of directions in which I can descend. Okay. If dk star is equal to 0, pick j prime such that mu k j prime is less than 0. Okay? Remove Oh, not j prime, j bar, okay? So pick j bar such that mu k j bar is less than zero. Remove j bar from the set of active constraints. Okay. In MATLAB, you will write it as AK, J bar, all columns is a null set. Okay, this is the way to remove a row from a matrix AK. So this is the MATLAB notation. If you want to remove a row from MATLAB, you call the entire row of the matrix 
and then you set it equal to an empty vector. And so that row gets removed. OK? And then recompute dk star. Uh, so once you remove the remove j bar from the set of active constraint, pick. So compute dk star again. Let me call this a k bar. So compute dk star bar using a k bar. <coughs> and the claim is that dk bar star is a descent direction. All right. Okay. So this step is clear. Yeah. So this mu k is a vector, right? It has the same number of components as the number of rows of A matrix, A k matrix. So just pick one of the component which is e less than zero. So and you remove that from the set of active constraints. And then the third part of the algorithm is. The third claim is if mu k is greater than or equal to 0, which means all, all elements of the vector mu k is, uh, are non-negative, then x k is stationary, which means gradient of f x k transpose d is greater than or equal to 0. For all D uh, such that A X K plus D is less than or equal to B. Uh, I think I want to make it local. So for all d such that a k plus alpha d is less than or equal to b for alpha sufficiently small. OK? So that's the entire algorithm laid out in front of you. Uh, so let's go back to this example again and see what we are doing. Uh, so for claim two, the proof is pretty long. So, uh, and same thing for claim three, the proof is, uh, I, I wouldn't say long, but it's sort of time consuming and algebraic. So you can just read the section in the book. It's not important for, the, uh, for knowing uh, the working of the algorithm. So you start with x0. You have so many directions to pick from. You solve this optimization problem. You get d0, strictly positive, d0 star, not positive, but uh, non-zero. So you descend along that direction until you reach, until you hit the, oh, I haven't talked about how to pick alpha k. Well, you can pick alpha k according to any rule as long as you don't violate any of the constraints. OK, so pick alpha k, pick alpha k such that uh, a of x k plus alpha k 
dk is less than or equal to b. So this is the entire matrix A, this is the entire vector b. And alpha k is small, OK? So you can pick a constant step size, decreasing step size, or Armijo's rule, or whatever is your favorite method, as long as you make sure that you are always feasible, OK? So you're not going out of the constraint region. All right, so going back to this point, I am at x0. I solve the optimization problem. I figure out this is my d0 star. I reach x1 after taking a specific step size. Then I just have two directions to go in, solve this optimization problem, and I figure that I need to go in this direction. So I take a couple of a few steps here until I reach x4. At x4, my d star turns out to be equal to 0. So I need to figure out a way to relax one of the constraint and descend along some other direction. So I look at this vector mu k. I identify an element which is strictly negative, And I remove that from the set of active constraint. And once I do that, I recompute my d bar k star, which is by solve this optimization problem with a k replaced with a bar k. Uh, and then it is. Uh, well, not easy to show, but it can be shown that d bar k star is a descent direction, which means gradient of fxk transpose d bar k star is negative. So I did that at x4, and I realized that I need to remove a4 transpose x from the set of active constraints. So I move along the direction where these two constraints are valid. So I move along this direction until I reach x6. At which point, again, dk star turns out to be equal to 0. Then I examine mu 6 again and identify an active constraint that I need to let go. I realize that the active constraint a1 has to be let go. So in this case, I have to move in the direction of a3 transpose x equals to b3. So I take this path. This is my descent direction d6 star or d bar 6 star, OK? And then I keep moving along this direction until I reach the point x star. If it is at the boundary, if it is not at the boundary, then at some point of time, again, your dk star will be equal to 0. And you will realize that you need to remove a3 from the constraint, set of constraints, and then your vector will move inside. Your, uh, your direction will go inside the set, and then you will do the usual gradient descent and reach the point x star eventually, if it is inside the set. If it is at the boundary, this algorithm will continue solving a sequence of optimization problems of this type and then get to the point x star uh, eventually. Now, if the point, if the function fx is c transpose x, so if fx is c transpose x, then this derivative is always c transpose, OK? Because the derivative is c, uh, no matter what value of xk you pick. And so in that case, one way to speed up the algorithm is you start from here, you, go, you reach this particular point. Then from here, you directly jump to x4. From x4, you directly jump to this a vertex. And so after that, you keep jumping from one vertex to another, and then that vertex to another, as long as you maintain the descent direction. And eventually, you will converge to the vertex at which the minimum is achieved. Okay, And that algorithm is known as simplex algorithm. Okay. So simplex algorithm is fine-tuned for performance for linear programming problems, whereas manifold suboptimization method is, an, is a more general method, which does exactly what simplex algorithm attempts to do, but for nonlinear functions, OK? By solving this, uh, uh, by solving a series of optimization problems and uh, making sure that you're descending along the right directions until you reach a point 
that is stationary. Uh, as always, stationarity doesn't mean optimal solution. It just means that it satisfies necessary condition for optimality. You still have to check the sufficient condition for optimality to ensure that that point is optimal. Now, when you have a linear functional, then of course that point is optimal because it's a convex problem. It's both a concave problem as well as a convex problem. So uh, it has a nice structure. So what if, what if f x is concave? Can I do like, can I jump from one vertex to another? Yeah, so if f is concave, then also you can jump from one vertex to another because you know that the solution will be at one of the vertices. That's right. Yeah. Yes. Uh, if mu k is greater than or equal to zero, then we have to terminate this algorithm, right? Yeah. Then you are you are at a candidate local minimum. Okay. Yes. Uh, can you have to draw multiple directions when you are at a vertex? Uh, so this one tells you. This one tells you which direction to pick. Yeah, but after you drop the first, it's. So then you are guaranteed to be in a descent direction. Okay, so let's say there were two vec two points in mu k that were negative. You just have to pick one of the two. Okay, and in in both cases, so which, whichever one you pick doesn't matter. You will still be in a descent direction. Okay. Yes. How to select h of k? I mean. How to select with h of k? Uh, so second derivative of the function would be ideal because then you're doing a Newton's descent. Uh, but you can pick any other positive definite matrix. So you will implement this algorithm in, in MATLAB in assignment three, where I'm asking you to take HK to be identity all the time. Okay, but uh, that would be the equivalent of steepest descent, where HK is identity all the time. Okay. But you can pick whatever HK you want. Uh, as long as it's positive definite. Okay, all right, so next class onwards, we are going to talk about either proximal algorithms or Lagrange multiplier theory. I still have to decide what I want to do. Thank you.